Lord, we know freedoms like that are not free. Uh, it came at the cost of lives of many men and women over the years. And so, Lord, we, uh, we acknowledge that today as well. And Lord, salvation is the same way. We know that uh, it is a free gift, uh, but it didn't come free. It cost the life of and the blood of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for your provision for that and your great love for us. And so, Lord, as we reciprocate that love today, we're going to worship you in song, in prayer, in, in thought, in process, in fellowship, uh, and in your word. And so, Lord, help us to really just acknowledge who you are today. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we stand this morning. We're going to sing the solid rock. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only lean on Jesus' name. Oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Man, if you want to go ahead and be seated this morning. We have several announcements for you. Uh, hopefully you got a bulletin this morning. You're able to see <clears throat> some of those as we go through. I've got some additional ones I'm going to uh, let you have as well. Uh, first thing then this morning that we have is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, food pantry is this week at North Baptist from 1 to 4. Um, uh, if you can get here 1230-ish or so on that. Uh, to kind of get uh, set up and going. Uh, we do, uh, it will be different for this week, even with the lunch program that we got going, but it'll, it will work out uh, well with that. Uh, then Harvesters is June 7th. It's hard to believe that I uh, got up this morning and looked at my phone and it said it was May 19th. I'm not sure how that got here, but it is already. So June is, is quickly approaching. So anyway, food pantry here at North this week. Uh, so don't forget that, those that help. Uh, the new study is Rediscover Church. That begins today. Uh, the, the books are up here as well. Now, the, the green one is the, the Bible study. It's the study workbook. Uh, if you are following along on Facebook or um, on the webpage or whatever, as you look through that, those answers, those questions, the answers in there uh, will come from the Wednesday nights. You'll see that or the Sunday mornings. Uh, if you want one of the other books, the yellow books go along with it. Uh, it's got great information, great uh, things for you to read. So uh, those are up here as well, more available uh, reading time for you. So anyway, that begins today. Uh, there's the Tuesday night Bible study schedule. Uh, we'll meet this Tuesday. Then after this Tuesday, it goes to once a month through the summer. 
then picked up back in on September 10th, and we're going to begin weekly. So that's both men and women. Uh, you're always invited to come, even if you can only come once during the summer or whatever, however it works for you, uh, you're invited to come and, and share with that. The summer lunch program, this is kind of a unique thing. Uh, years ago, I interviewed a, a young guy for a, for a youth pastor's position at the church we were in, and uh, I got all the way through talking with him and interviewing him, and I got to the point, I said, uh, now your pay will be, and he was like, and I get paid for this too? And I was like, well, maybe not. I mean, let me go back on this. Uh, but I said, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's pay for this. And so he was, he was all excited. He, he wanted to be the youth pastor, whether he got paid or not. So that was really kind of cool. The summer lunch program kind of came up that way as well. Uh, she, somebody asked if we wanted to take part in the summer lunch program. And I was like, sure. I don't know what it is, but it sounds like really cool. Um, uh, and, uh, so as, um, Things were busy, could not get meetings done, and so we finally had some, uh, a meeting on Thursday afternoon with the uh, state of Kansas and ECAN and uh, found out that uh, they have workers, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, it's people from the community, uh, different aspects of that. Um, so really, what? and then the lunches are made at, at Mid-America, or whatever the name is up there now, but, and the lunches are brought over. They're brought over at uh, around 11, 11, 15, uh, they'll be set up in there, and then uh, they serve. For us at North Baptist, we get to be just really ambassadors for the for the church uh, to go around, kind of meet the kids, greet the kids, kind of uh, you know learn their names, get to know who they are, and just be a part of their their lives. and And so I even asked her again to make sure it was okay. I said, "Now, can we do stuff uh, like out in the back lot, like a bounce house or something after the lunch?" And she's like, "Oh yeah, you know whatever." Whatever you want to do afterwards, that's all okay. The kids that stay, that's great. You know, no guarantee they will, but I said, I said, okay. So um, we get to basically host it and be ambassadors for Christ to the community lunch summer program. So it's really kind of a cool thing. Um, if you want to help, be sure and let me know. Um, we'll need different ones throughout the summer to maybe help unlock the door to get them in like when we're on vacation and stuff. But uh, really the, the work is provided by them. Uh, if you love kids and just want to be a part of their lives, uh, this is it. I mean, it's a great way to, uh, to be a part of that. So uh, thankful for what we get to do there. All right. Uh, then the missions team is on there. Uh, there's some names up here on a sheet if you want to take that home. Uh, those are the ones that are coming so far. Uh, continue to pray for them as we get closer. Um, I'm excited about that too with that summer lunch program and the missions team. We're really going to try to get to know them kids and do some things each day differently for them. And my prayer is by the end of the week, then maybe Cynthia can uh, share the, the bracelets, which I wish I had. Mine broke yesterday. After almost a year, I made it about 50 of the 52 weeks, uh, the bracelets that she uh, gives them to uh, share Jesus with them. Uh, so hopefully we can do that by the end of the week. So a uh, great opportunity. Um, and then serve day is coming up. Uh, beginning today, I need you to start thinking about whether you want to help or not. I'm going to start needing some t-shirt sizes. Uh, cost for this for us is like $10 That's for a t-shirt and lunch. That's that's better than the, the mini man up thing. I think I you had to pay more for that. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, um, serve day is the 22nd. That's a t-shirt and lunch uh, for $10. I'm going to need some t-shirt sizes here pretty quick. Uh, we'll have a sign up next week and uh, we'll begin with that and, and go forward. So uh, super excited. Um, other announcements. Let's see. Um, oh, BBS at Rahema is... The first week of June, so if you have nine to noon, if you can help or want to help, in your microphone, let Shelly know. If you have kids that are kindergarten through sixth grade, uh, we can help get them out there, or you can transport them, or however that works. But it's always been really good been able to share with them and and do that. So so that's coming up. So that'll be in the uh, the list as well. Okay, next it says four to sixth grade. So, okay. All right. Prayer concerns. Uh, uh, this, this is a huge praise 
to God. So I got to make sure you're sitting down. Okay, everybody's sitting down. Uh, that's what the guy told me on Friday. Uh, we started talking and, and conversing over the deal with uh, the elevator. Uh, we got a little concerned because by July 1st, we were supposed to be um, have it inspected, which was then going to cost us about, with our maintenance, about 4000 to $4,500 a year. Um, through it all, uh, I talked with the pastor on Friday who lives down around Whitewater, Kansas, if you all know El Dorado in that area there. Uh, he works part-time at the elevator, uh, at the elevator, at the library, and they have a chairlift that went up six steps, and it cost about $800 to have them inspected. And, and he didn't pay for it, obviously. It was the public library, so they, they got it paid for, but he thought that was an atrocity, you know, that they had to do that. And so he started making some calls and got a hold of his representative and from the state of Kansas, and then he came out and uh, viewed everything and looked at it and could not believe that that's what it cost them to have that chairlift uh, to be able to operate. And they started going through some things, and by Friday of this week, uh, Governor Kelly signed a thing, uh, there's no more inspections. And so that is gone. We have to have a maintenance contract, which we already do, uh, but, and then we keep track of the maintenance contracts, and every three years you have to turn in a maintenance contract to the state of Kansas Fire Marshal so he can look at it or she can look at it, whoever it is, and uh, make sure it's all okay. So uh, that, that was a huge praise. That's a huge weight lifted off. It's been a long uh, last year or so for me, especially trying to figure out how that was going to work and go through it and, and struggles of needing that elevator and the cost that was involved and the frustration of it. And so I uh, really thank Jesus for his provision. Thank a lot of other people for a lot of work they did on it. Uh, we had several in our body that were even working on it as well. So anyway, that's a, that is a huge uh, praise this morning. Um, on your prayer list there, you got quite a few things. Um, do you want to add to it? Uh, and, and they'll be down at the bottom if they're added to it because they're in kind of alphabetical order. Uh, you can see Marvin's sister is on there, a Aileen, for uh, just uh, an unspoken prayer request. Uh, Kathy Marvin, we're going to get her daughter on there, uh, Marita. Uh, she has cancer and uh, that chemo that she had taken was supposed to work and work for a long time and it doesn't seem to be. And so they're going to need to do something different. And so want to continue to lift uh, her up in prayer as well. Um, Angel Powell has been coming. I want to just kind of lift her up in prayer as, a, as an unspoken as well. Uh, multiple others on there. It's kind of a praise. We'll have an empty spot where that thing that says elevator concerns are on there now. So um, I might just leave it blank so we can remember. Thank you, Jesus, for that. So uh, anyway, we have several other prayers on there. Continue to remember each one of those and the different things that are going on. Uh, multiple things that we have. Uh, and so with that this morning, if you'd join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for uh, your provision. We thank you for grace. We thank you for... So many times we worry about things that uh, never come to even be. But yet worry consumes us. And so Lord, help us to, to trust you in a greater way. Trust you more than uh, what we normally do. Uh, Lord, help us to be a, a part of our lives is that we, we trust instead of stress instead of worry. And Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're doing in multiple lives here that we see on the, on the prayer list. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the provision of the elevator. We thank you for the uh, summer lunch program, the food pantries, uh, all those activities outside of the, of the box, Lord. Uh, but we thank you for the way you provide on individual lives as we continue to see that, Lord. We see uh, Terry Moon here even this morning. And so we thank you that you continue to work in him and, Lord, multiple others. And so we just give that to you, Lord. Just continue to provide in a way that only you can. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I do have one graduate this morning. It's on the back page of your uh, bulletin there this morning. It's uh, Marcus England. Um, there's a picture of Marcus with uh, his, I'm going to make sure I get it right, great-grandparents, uh, Don and Pat Miller. Uh, that's the only one I've got so far. If you've got graduates, be sure to let me, let me know. But uh, um, that is uh, Michael England's son. That is uh, Myron and Tracy England's grandson. 
Uh, some of these you might know. We, we know them all, I guess. But, uh, and, then, and then Don and Pat. So it was a, it was a good picture. Um, Don doesn't look real happy right there. Uh, so if they're watching this morning, which they probably are, sorry, Don, but uh, just smile next time because you never know where that picture is going to end up, right? <laughs> so anyway, congratulations to Marcus and, and to Don and Pat and, and to uh, Martin and Tracy and, and Michael and all of them as he, as he moves on. He's going to go to the Missouri Institute of Welding. So that's kind of an exciting thing to know that uh, just um, what some of our, the people of our people are doing, right? So uh, that's what we want to remember. All right, so this morning, if you want to stand, we're going to sing, well, you get to stand, and we're going to sing, they'll know we are Christians, amen. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each other's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father for whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. If you want to be seated this morning, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Uh, children are going to depart for children's church this morning. So if you want to get moving in that direction, if you are part of that crew this morning. That, yeah, don't do that. Follow that. Hey, see you, buddy. Hi, Penelope. <gasps> wow. Yes. All right, so we need to, uh, as I said just a moment ago, uh, our, our Wi-Fi is struggling at this point. So as you're praying, make sure this message gets out. It's the beginning of, of Rediscover Church, right? So we are uh, in week one. Uh, it's kind of a... It's kind of a unique uh, book that was kind of written towards the uh, end of, of COVID, but it already had statistics for things that were going on before. And so one of the things on the book we don't have up here right now, but uh, if you were to pick up a book right in the middle of it in a gold thing, it says uh, why the body of Christ is essential. And we learned that word during COVID, right? Essential. What is essential? And so we're going to see that the body of Christ is essential, especially in our world today and maybe more so now than, than ever. And so we're going to rediscover church over the next several weeks on different aspects of the church, what the church is, what it does, how it functions, why it's even 
uh, there and then to know that it is essential, right? Everybody say essential. That was that new word that we learned, right? So, uh, but now we're going to see that the church is essential. And so we're going to begin this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, 25 through 27. And we're going to talk this morning again about uh, rediscovering church. And the first week is, what is church? And so beginning in verse 25, it says, For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. We join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, again this morning, we, we come before you. Lord, we have an opportunity this morning that only comes through Jesus that we can go directly to the throne. And so, Lord, we're, we're thankful for your provisions in our life from forgiveness to grace to mercy to your love. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to see that in a, in a greater way. Help us to understand that. And Lord, even this morning as we begin a new series on, on rediscovering the church, Lord, that we would understand our individual role and impact into the world today. Lord, we just pray this morning that we can put aside all the, the busyness of life, all the worries, as I mentioned earlier, the things that consume us, and that we would just rest in you. And Lord, as we rest in you this morning, I just pray that you are able to speak in a way that we're able to hear and understand. And so, Lord, we are thankful. We're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for the way you provide. We're thankful for the relationship that we can have with you. And so, Lord, we give you praise. And we acknowledge you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning's message is entitled, What is Church? What is the church? Now, you might think that's a strange scripture, you know, Ephesians chapter 5, to open up with uh, when we're talking about the church. But hopefully by the time we get to the end, we're going to see just what is really uh, going on there, what's, what, what's being talked about there. And so today, I hope you're ready with me to rediscover church and see what that means. It's, uh, it's a change in pattern. It kind of goes well with the marks of a disciple where we came through to kind of see where we are as, uh, as a Christian, as, a, as, as part of that body of Christ, and, and kind of evaluate where we are to see where our strengths are, see where the things that we might need to work on. And then we're going to rediscover church. Now, if you were to, if I was just to kind of uh, pick a, a group of you and just have you go down here to Casey's some Sunday morning and, and just start asking people, well, what is the church? Most everybody would answer the building. Well, there's, there's one up here on Wilson on the north side. There's one up here on Wilson a little bit farther down on the, on the right side. There's, there's several of them on the south side. And, and they could describe you what the building looks like even. And for some of them, they might have been inside those buildings and they could tell you what the inside looked like or what it used to look like or, or, or what's happening, but they would describe the, the building, the facility. And so that's not really a biblical understanding of what church really is. And so that's why we need to, to rediscover what church is. The Greek word for church is ecclesia, and, and that word means an assembly. It means the called out people. And so really, I was thinking about that this week. So the next time somebody asks you, where do you go to church? You can say, I don't go to church. I am the church. 
They don't say that arrogantly, right? But, uh, but we aren't. We don't, we don't go to church. This building is a building until the church comes in. Now, we call it church. We're registered in the name as church. But you and I, together, we're the, the church. And so the church then, we're going to see as we rediscover, is that the church is the body of Christ. Everybody say body of Christ. Where Jesus is the head. The church then is the body, and it's made up of, of born-again believers in Jesus Christ. From the, from the day of Pentecost until Jesus returns, all of those are part of the body. Now, we live in different eras and different, different times but that is the body of Christ. And so that means we can view church in two ways. One way is that I just mentioned that from, from Pentecost until Jesus returns, there's the universal church. And so if you've accepted Jesus as, as your Lord and Savior, then you are a part of that universal church. It's for all those who have Submitted their lives, surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. That's the universal church. And then we see there's the local church. And that's what most of the letters in the New Testament were written to individual churches. The local church. And so, even though we and, and you and myself are, are part of that universal church, we're called to be a part of the local church and in the local church that's where we expand that's where we serve it's where we use the gifts that god has given us to be a part of this body of christ this this body of believers so north baptist then is a local body where you seek fellowship encouragement and training in a place to where you can then serve God. And so not only do you seek fellowship, you seek encouragement, you bring fellowship and you bring encouragement to others as well. Now the Apostle Paul, as he was writing to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 and 13, he said, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one body we could sing that hokey pokey song right where you put your right hand in and your left hand in and your right foot in and your left foot in we did that one time and you all thought we were weird but that that's kind of a cool song but it kind of shows us that that that's part all those parts make one body and so it is with the body of christ some of us are jews as paul's saying some are gentiles some are slaves some are free but we've all been baptized into one spirit and we all share the same spirit. So we might be many parts and we have different functions, but we come together to be one body to where Jesus Christ is the head. And so that's what the Apostle Paul is saying at that point as he writes to Corinth. The letter that we started with was in Ephesians, which was the church of Ephesus. And so there's a lot of local churches that were letters were written to and they still are reflective for us today. So we see as we begin this morning that church is not a building. Church is where we come together to do, where we assemble, the called out or assembled, to do ministry and however that looks. Now maybe that's the food pantry, maybe that's um, the Bible studies, maybe that's the men's event or the women's event or this uh, new uh, summer lunch program, just different things that we do ministry in. But the church is not the building. The church is the people. If nobody showed up here on Sunday morning, we're still the church. And so I thought about that. You know, uh, really, the only way something would happen to this building would be something tragic, right? Like a tornado, which we do not want. Or I'm not sure fire could even take this place down, but... Uh, Something, something tragic, some high winds or something. But if that was the case, that would be okay. Because then the first Sunday, we're going to meet in Brad and Linda Gilgis' garage, right? 
So, right, and the next week we're going to be at Greg's house. Uh, we're going to be in his garage, so bring your chair. And that just shows us that it really doesn't matter where we meet, we are the church. Now, we meet here because this is where we do ministry. We meet on the north side because we see there's a, there's a need for this. Uh, in our meeting with the, with the state of Kansas and the, and the people from ECAN on Thursday, they said that, you know, we're in the Lincoln School District up here, and that's where our food pantry is a part of. The Lincoln School District, 79% of those children that go to the Lincoln School have free or reduced lunch. So there's a great need. And that's not a lot, I mean, a lot of kind of the same way throughout the community, but there, there's just a great, great need. So we see there's a, a need. So we meet here to do ministry. But you, me, those around you this morning, that, that's the church. And so now that we kind of understand what, what church is, that's what we're going to look at now. What does the church do? Well, we do serve day. We do food pantry. We do the summer lunch program now. We do Bible study. We do, and, and that's great that we do that but really in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, um, it, you know, they, a lot of people have said, well, that's a great verse for a church vision or a church mission. But really, that verse is really a model for the church. And so we need to model what that says. And so what it says in 242 is that all believers devoted themselves, okay, believers, what is that? Well, that's the body of Christ those that believe in Jesus Christ, those who had submitted and surrendered their life to him, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. What's the apostles' teachings? That's Jesus. To fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So that means the church body, that's us, right? We should be teaching sound, biblically, theologically sound teachings. A couple weeks ago, that's exactly what you heard. That's an important aspect of the church, biblically speaking. That way the church can be grounded in their faith and what, what we believe. And that faith is in Jesus Christ alone. It's not a tradition. It's not a creed. Because if we're not based if we're not sound in our belief and our faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to be tossed to and fro by every wind and wave. We may not have a lot of waves coming up here on the north side, but we all know in Kansas we can face a lot of wind, right? And some of that stuff is really strong and it kind of blows us around. And so the belief in the world will blow us around if we're not grounded in our, in our belief in Jesus Christ. In, in God's word. And so the very first thing the church is to do then is to be founded in the apostles' teaching, that teaching of Jesus. And then providing for a place to have fellowship. Um, Paul used the word, Peter uses the word koinonia, right? So, so it's a fellowship that's beyond just Hi, how y'all doing? Y'all good? I'm good. Okay, see ya. Fellowship is really coming together and, and being a part. The fellowship where the believers can be devoted to biblical teaching, to where a point where you can invite somebody in here and you would know they were going to hear about Jesus. Amen? And that's what it should be. To where they could, you could invite somebody in and they would, they would have fellowship. Communication. Um, we had that the the many man thing there a couple of weeks ago and had surveys and um, most of the surveys that came back said they enjoyed lunch not because Keith smoked the meat even though it was good but because they got to sit at tables with other guys that they normally don't usually get to sit at and they said so they had some great fellowships and several of them said they even meet some new uh, people that now they could be uh, friends with. And they look forward to fellowshipping with them again. And so we see that fellowship is an important thing. And so we, we come together to, 
to greet one another, but it's, it's more than that. Fellowship is gathering together. It's instructing one another. It's encouraging one another. It's being able to learn from one another and then to teach others. And then there's that sharing in the Lord's Supper. And so as the church comes together, the reason that we partake in the Lord's Supper is to remember what Jesus has done for us. We do this in remembrance of, of him. He's provided a great thing for us eternally, but he also continues to provide for us today. And so then there's also those, those meals, those fellowship can go right into meals, and, and those don't have to be done here. They can be done at, in, in Brad and Linda's garage. We're going to use your garage today. Uh, so <clears throat> I think they're going on vacation pretty quick. I'll let you know when we're going to meet out there. Oh, we got to clean it out first. Okay. But, uh, but it, it, you know, we can have lunch together at other places or do things together. And so it's, it is breaking bread, right, in fellowship, but it is also remembering what Jesus has done for us. And then the last thing they mentioned is, is prayer. And so the church body, the church, not the building, but the people should be a place that that promotes prayer, that teaches and, and practices prayer and the importance of prayer. In, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, <clears throat> it says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He does. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And so we see that, that prayer is communication. You know, that's one of the important things. Paul says in, in Thessalonians that we're to pray without ceasing. And so to pray without ceasing means that we, we have a conversation with God. We thank him. We adore him. We ask for things. We... Praise for the things that have been provided. We're thankful. And so it's, it's a process of who we are. And as Paul's saying that, he's not really saying that, well, you know, we need to stay at home. We need to be on our knees in prayer with our eyes closed and our, our hands bowed. And, and so we're just going to pray all day. And, and if you have that capability, that's great. But that's really not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is, as you drive to work, you can be in prayer. You don't have to have your eyes closed. You can be praying for somebody that's on the list. You can be praying for some things that are in your life. You can thank him for the beautiful day. You can thank him for the way he provides. You can thank him for the safety that sometimes we don't even really understand. All those things, and it's just a continual process on the, on the way to work, on the way to church, on the way to, uh, or on the way to the facility, uh, on the way to wherever you go, whatever you do, Prayer can be a part of who you are, and then teaching that that's, that's what we need to be a part of. And that we're not trying to change God's mind in this, but what we're trying to do is to get aligned with God's mind and God's word in our life so that we can figure out what he's trying to do. Now, what else would the church to be a part of? Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, we're going to see 19 and 20, but in, in verse 18, he says, I have all authority and power, and it's been given to me in heaven and on earth. And because he has that kind of authority, because he has that kind of power, he then says, therefore. Now, what's that therefore? It's therefore Jesus has all the authority and power. And he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus here, uh, he institutes the, the great commission, right? That, that go. And so, so here's the thing. If the church is this building, when Jesus says go... It's going to take more than us to lift this building up and go. Amen? I, we're not going to be able to get that done. But then if you do, you've got to be sure and put it back right where it was. 
Not crooked, not sideways. It's got to go right back in the exact spot. So he's saying to the church, I have all the authority and power. And because of that, church, you need to go. So we know he's not talking about the building. He's talking about us. He said, go make disciples of all nations. So the church is called to be faithful then in sharing the gospel, the, which is the good news. And it's the good news about Jesus. And it's the good news about his death and burial and resurrection. And so in Jesus, we find hope, right? And so through that word, Jesus said we're to be, as a church, we're to be a lighthouse. Well, now that's convenient, right? We have a ministry site that is called the Lighthouse, right? And so I thought, what is the... I've, we've been in Michigan on vacation several summers. We've seen several lighthouses. And I kind of had an idea of what a lighthouse was, right? It, it shines its light around to boats to let them know kind of where the land is. And if they can see the light, then they might need to stay out where they are. And so that's kind of that's my thought of the lighthouse. Several of them you can go up in and you climb up in. And so when we had little girls, they did not think that was fun. Uh, <laughs> Because you had to go up these stairs that you could see through. And it would like scare them to death as we climbed to the top. Now those didn't bother me until we got up to the top and you were able to go outside. And that was not fun for me, right? But I thought, you know, what is the lighthouse? And, and so I, I looked it up. The lighthouse is to serve as an aid to those that are navigating by warning them of hazards, helping them to establish their position, and guiding them to their destination. A lighthouse is, to, is there to signal danger and provide safety to those who are passing by. And I thought, man, that's, that's really awesome because in, in one sense, uh, we have a ministry facility called the Lighthouse, and it sits right on 68 as people pass by and go all the time. And we have another ministry facility right here in Ottawa, which you're sitting in right now if you're in person. And right here, uh, Wilson is one of the second busiest streets on this whole side, right? And so people are always navigating by. Thursday evening, we took the associational trailer up to... Um, I forgot the name of it. Huh? Falls City. Not Paul City. Falls City, Nebraska. You know where that's at? It's straight up 75 almost all the way, and then you kind of turn a little bit. And so that's the farthest north part of our association. And we're almost the farthest south, except for Iola beyond us. But, um, and so we take the trailer up there, and, and I've been there before. I took it to them last year, and this year I had had riders that went along with me. And, and so I, I still punched in my GPS to make sure as I get clear up towards the north end, almost the Falls City, there's a couple turns you got to make. And, and uh, I, I didn't want to miss those. And so I punched in my GPS. And when I get there, it says, you've reached your destination <laughs> for today. But I thought that's kind of unique too because we're to be a lighthouse serving aid to those that are navigating by, warning them of hazards, helping them to establish their position, guiding them to their destination. And their destination isn't here. Now, they might come alongside for a while, but their destination is heaven. And so we're to guide people in that way, helping them to get to their destination. A lot of them don't even know where their destination is. So we got to get to that point as well. And then we are to signal danger and provide safety for those that are passing by. So the church should be in the community pointing people to the Savior who's Jesus Christ, promoting and sharing the gospel 
And then even preparing one another to be able to share the gospel. Now, Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, you must, everybody say must, must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. Now, we don't have to. That has got to become a choice. But Peter said, for the body of Christ, it's a, it's a must. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And, and that's where we kind of put a period on that, right? Ooh, pastor, I'm not sure I'm qualified in that. I don't know enough scripture. I can't get to that point of really sharing with people. I'm just, I'm just, it just gives me the eebie-jeebies, right? If that's really a word. And so it kind of makes me uncomfortable. And, and, and here's the thing. Uh, it, it makes us all uncomfortable because we all have things that we are uncomfortable with. But Peter said, it's a must for those who worship Christ to be able to share their Christian hope. And as you share your Christian hope, they really, uh, honestly, they don't want to know how much scripture you know. They don't want to know as you lead them through the Bible what's here and there because for the most part, they're not even sure what this is or what it says. What they want to know, though, is why did you accept Jesus? What got you to the point of accepting Jesus as your Savior? And, 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 when, and when you did, what difference did it make? Peter said it should make a difference. Now, we're all messes, right? So it takes a while to get to a, a mature place but it should continually make a difference. That's why we, that, that Acts 2.42 is supposed to be a, an important part of our lives because we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, who's teaching about Jesus. We devote ourselves to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer, and that helps in the process of our growing into maturity so that we can share our Christian hope. Yeah, it's great to be able to lead them through Scripture or take them down the Roman road or, or, or the peace of Christ or whatever that is. But they want to know, really, what did it do for you? If it didn't do anything for you, then why do I want it? Why would I want something that's not even working for you, right? And if you don't need, I got an old lawnmower. Uh, it don't work. But I can't sell it for the same price as I could for one that was working, Right? And even if you could work on it and fix it, you wouldn't want to pay me the same price as the new one, would you? Now, if you do, come talk to me right after the service. Because I do have a couple that I'd be let to go for a healthy price. But that's what it is. Is Christ working in our lives? And I don't mean <clears throat> working. I don't mean protecting. I mean... Are, are you seeing a difference? And maybe the, the bigger part would be, do others see a difference? And Peter said they, they should. We worship Christ because he's the Lord of our lives. And others will see that and they want to know, what kind of hope do you have? Well, this is, I have hope in Jesus. And so now we see, you know, Acts, Acts 2.42, we see Jesus has, has instituted then this great commission for the church. Again, he's not talking about a building. He's talking about the church. Go and make disciples. And then we see Peter. We've talked about Paul. We've talked about Matthew. We've talked about Jesus. We see Peter saying we've got to have this hope. And then we think about James, right? So James is the half-brother of, of Jesus. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he really didn't come to real faith in, in Christ until after the resurrection. That's what made a difference in his life. And he says, James says that it's not just about warming a church chair on Sunday morning. He said pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and... Refusing to let the world corrupt you. It's really two things there that James groups into one. But we need to see it as two. 
caring for orphans and widows. We can be a part of that, right? Yeah, we can help with the food pantry or we might go mow somebody's yard or we can clean out some gutters or we can do some things that need to be done. But refusing to let the world corrupt me, is that the same thing? It's probably bigger. And we live in the world, so we're a part of the world, so it's easier to have the world corrupt us than it is to help an orphan or a widow. And so we have these opportunities. So the church is is not the building. The church is you and I. And we're to be about the the business of, of ministering to those in need. If we see a need and don't do it, James says, are we any different than the world? No. We're to be about sharing the gospel and providing for physical needs. Food, clothing, shelter, uh, physical, physical help. It's in those things at times that we're able to then share Jesus because we've been able to get into a relationship with people. And so the church, that's us, that's not this building. The church is to equip believers in Christ with the tools they need to help us to overcome sin and be a part of of what it is to look like a Christian. And it's done through sound biblical teaching, right? In, In Christian fellowship. And it's refusing to let the world corrupt you. And it's really, it, it's getting to the point of, of being difficult. I, I shared at uh, Pomona this morning, that picture on the front of your bulletin this morning is a, is a picture, if you don't know it, that's a picture of North Baptist. Wow, that was huge, right? Uh, I knew you wouldn't know that unless I told you. That was a picture that was on the internet that AI, artificial intelligence, made a sketch of and you say yeah okay that's that's huge because artificial intelligence has got to the point now to where you really can't tell what's real from what's not real i think it was in february that uh the official who is the um top person at the Pentagon said he watched a video of the Pentagon being bombed and exploding into flames and he said if he hadn't have been sitting in there right at that time he would have thought it was real but it wasn't and so we're getting to the point now where it's hard to tell from the world what's real and what's not. And they can take little bits of pieces of something, and it could be you, and make something completely different out of it. That's scary. But that's where the world is, is getting us to that point. And so we got to not let the world corrupt us. We got to not let this become such a worry that we worry so much about it. But our faith and our hope has got to be in Jesus Christ. He said, you can't let the world corrupt you. You can't become a part of the world and still be the church for Jesus in this world today. And that's huge. That's key. And so that's what James is kind of bringing to the table as well then. The the tools. The Apostle Paul said back in in 1 Corinthians 12, we're not going to go there, but that's kind of pulled a little bit out of that earlier, that that the church is to be those, the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus in this world today. And it's not the hokey pokey, right? But, But that's what we're supposed to be. We're the body of Christ. We are the church. It is not this building. This building is not going to get up and go somewhere Unless God chooses. But we do. And we are then the body of Christ. We are the church. We are to be Christian. We're to be Christ-like. And we're to be Christ-following. 
We're to follow him where he tells us to go. We're to be like Jesus in this world. And so that takes us back around full circle then to Ephesians chapter 5. For husbands, this means love your wives as Christ loved the church. He, who is Jesus, gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. And so that's a simple command, but it's hard to follow. And it's hard to follow, especially if you're not a born-again believer or if you're just a nominal Christian. Now, if you have your Bibles open this morning, you can kind of look at Ephesians chapter 5 or your phone or wherever you're at, kind of scroll back and forth. If you have any idea of what is going on here in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul just said for wives to submit to their husbands. And of course, what he's talking about is the, the church. Now, that's something that they understood, right? Marriage, they understood marriage. They, they got married. They, uh, he even quotes some scriptures from Genesis where we leave our father and mother and become one. Have you become one with Jesus? Have you submitted your life to him fully? That's what it's really about. That's what Paul's talking about. We get all caught up on, wives, you better submit to your husband. You better, you better listen up. You hear what Paul said? No, Paul said, we all are the bride of Christ and have you submitted to Jesus. And then he goes on talking about the husband there. And he said, you know, the husband, is, is, there, there's no excuse for being a, a dictator. There's no excuse for being a, a persecutor of the wife. And he said, there's, there's no, there's a no there where the husband is really the head of the wife because you see that whether it's the wife or the husband, that Jesus is the head. And it's interesting because the Apostle Paul uses a word for love in this scripture and he's talking about the word agape. Now, back in, back in that time, uh, in the Greek, there were multiple words for love. And so as they used that specific word, everybody knew what somebody was saying. And now we all use the same word, right? I love my dog. I love ice cream. I love church. I love today. It's beautiful outside until it gets hot later. Um, I, and so we group all this together in love. But Paul's saying, no, what I'm saying here is agape and agape is a different type of love it's sacrificing it's giving without expecting repayment agape doesn't change ever it, it's not based on circumstances it's not based on situations it's not demanding Again, it doesn't expect repayment. It's love expressed. And so that's what Paul is saying. That's the way Jesus loves the church. Not this building. You. Sacrificial. And he's saying, that's how we are to love. We don't do something so we can get something out of it. We help the orphans and the widows because we love them and know there's a need and God has given us the strength and ability to be able to provide. We love our wives not because we have to, but because that's what he calls us to, to be one. And so, Paul goes on to say that, that Jesus loved the church so much, not this building, but you. He loved this building so much that he would die for you in your place. See, that's the kicker. We're all sinners and we deserve death. The wages of sin is death. And so what we deserve is death. And from the moment we are born, we are headed to death. 
But in the process, Jesus steps in and he provides a way for life. And it's only through him. It's through faith in Jesus because of what he's done. And so Jesus' attitude towards the church is the pattern for a, a, a Christian husband to love his wife. It's the purpose. And so Paul taught two things here between the husband and wife. And, and it's really about the relationship with Christ and his church, but he, he, he uses the husband and wife as an example. As Paul taught that Jesus loves the world and he died for it. Jesus loves the church with a special love. Not because we deserve it, but because he knows your potential. He created you. And so the husband then is to, to love his wife in that, in that way. And so, yes, when people say, God loves everyone, that's true. He does. But he has a special love for his church. And so the same way, a husband and wife should be the same way. As a husband, I can love all of you. And I should. But I better love my wife more. I can love my dog. Tell potty's on the floor. But I should love my wife more. <laughs> And that's what Paul's saying. Jesus doesn't love the church for what the church can do for him. Jesus loves the church for what he can make it. And so Jesus' action towards the church then is the pattern that defines agape love. It's a sacrificing love. And so, Paul says, how should the husband love his wife? As Christ loves the church. It, it's right there. And so Jesus then wants more than just an external surface relationship with you. When Jesus asks, how are you? He really doesn't want you to say, fine, see you later. He knows how you are. He's waiting on you to acknowledge that. That's what he, you know, you go back to Genesis and Adam and Eve had sinned and God comes looking for him and he said, Adam, where are you? A Adam was not hidden. He did not get out of the way. He wants to know, Adam, do you know where you are? And so this morning, do you know where you are? And I don't mean physically in this building called North Baptist Church. I mean, do you know where you are? You are incomplete without Christ. On the front of your bulletin this morning, as well as on the screen, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. And it says, and the church is his body. Everybody say his body. Yeah. And it's not this building. This building is not Jesus' body. You and I together make up parts of Jesus' body. And it is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. That shows us just how incomplete we really are without Christ. And we live in a world who do not know that. Who does not understand that. And that's why we are to be a lighthouse proclaiming the gospel and the, the good news about Jesus warning them of the hazards and all the obstacles that are in the way, guiding them and leading them in a path that will get them to the right destination. So what is the church? The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ. It's the fullness of Christ. It's made complete in Christ. And it's the people who truly accept Jesus' free gift of salvation and follow his teachings. 
Throughout the New Testament, the Bible always refers to the church as people. And it's not just people, it's people who follow Jesus. That's why we begin today needing to really rediscover church. And so over the next several weeks, we're just going to look at different aspects of that and understanding and realize that the body of Christ, the church, is essential in this world today. And so now we can see why we need to rediscover church. And so the point is this morning, what about you? Are you a part of the church? Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Maybe that's the point that uh, you need to uh, start with this morning. Maybe you've gotten to the point where you've wandered off the path and <clears throat> the GPS is saying, you need to make a right turn here and you're arguing with her. No, this is left, dear. You're not going in the way I want to go. And realize that uh, we need to quit arguing with the real position sensor and following him in the direction that he wants to go. And so do you want to be a part of the church? Not this building. The fellowship. The apostles' teaching. The breaking of bread. Prayer. The going that Jesus calls us to, all of us to, accepting that provision to being able to share the hope that we have do you have a hope and i pray this morning that you you do and that hope is in jesus if your hope is in this building this is going to crumble one day our hope has got to be in jesus and james said we we need to take care of some business ministering while we're here and we might use this facility to do it, but this facility is not the church. You are. And that's why we've got to be careful not to get caught up in the world. Because the world will draw us away from what we've, our business to do. And so with that, this morning we'll close with that. Do you want to be a part of the church? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for truth that we find in your word. And Lord, we know that it's truth that leads us and guides us and directs us. And Lord, this morning, I just pray that you will continue, even as we leave today from this facility, to guide and direct us on a path that would lead us to that final destination. But people on our path that we can share the blessed hope that we have that's in your son, Jesus Christ. And through that, that you would receive all the glory and honor. And so, Lord, we thank you for this day. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you want to stand this morning, we're going to sing The Church in the Wildwood. If, if God has spoken to you this morning, I, I'd encourage you to come as we sing. And share what God is doing in your life. works when it says men that's when you sing men when it says women that's when you're gonna have to sing because patty's not here today to lead you so you're gonna have to kick it up another notch right unless unless anybody wants to one of you ladies want to come up here and oh come on yeah they're all pointing at you <laughs>
And she's shaking her head, no. Okay, so, so you ladies got to pick it up. Okay? All right, microphone. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Stand, run back and get a microphone. Okay. Yeah, hang on. You, 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 can play, you can play a little ditty. All right, verse 2. Make sure it goes on. Okay. the church you didn't know you were going to get aerobics <laughs> and singing lessons oh man that's, that's awesome because you is the church right not the building hey we always give you an opportunity to take part in the ministries at north whether you're on facebook if you're on facebook again i encourage you to always share this on your facebook page or your story uh, really i'm way late i should have told you to do that at the very beginning because then it gets people to be able to join live with us but uh, there's still so many people that are be able to watch the message and and I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that need to rediscover church. And so they need to hear uh, that kind of message. And so uh, we encourage you to share that. Uh, you, can, you can donate financially to the, to the body uh, through uh, giving online on the webpage there at www.autoembc.org. That may kick me off. I don't know. Um, Facebook's not happy anyway. So uh, you, can, you can do that through there uh, on, on a giving page. You can give through there. You can text to give. You can... Um, mail a check to the church, put attendance and lend on the envelope and it all gets to the same places or you can drop it in the offering plates on Sunday morning. Uh, but it all helps those ministries, just like the Lighthouse, which, which you really are, you are a part of that and uh, help to share the gospel through there. And so uh, as we left this morning, uh, several of them said, said thank you for continuing. Uh, uh, they, 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 en they enjoy the time that they're there. They'll be able to uh, minister to one another. There's a fellowship going on there. And so it's really uh, a kind of a unique setting. You're always welcome to come at, at 830 out there and, and join because uh, it's, a, it's a different group of people. It's kind of unique. Uh, but financially, that helps support some of those things as well as the other ministries we do. And so uh, it's always a joy to be able to be a part together. And so with that, we're going to sing the, the last verse to uh, Church in the Wildwood. And so when it comes to the chorus, and ring it out, man, this is you, right? You is the church getting ready to head out into the world. And then I'll close with some prayer. From the church in the valley of the wildwood, when Come on. 
in the veil. Lord, we just thank you again this morning for an opportunity to come to this facility, to gather together as your church, as your body of Christ that you call North Baptist. And Lord, I'm thankful for uh, each one here today, those that have joined us on Facebook. Lord, I'm thankful for those that are, are apart and are gone today traveling or wherever they're at, and just ask for your presence to, to bring them safely uh, back into the midst. Lord, help us as we go through this week. Help us to be focused on you. Help us to pay attention to how the world wants to draw us in, uh, but you want to draw us out in a way, but still being apart. Lord, we just thank you for your provision. Thank you for your love. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen.